All right, so today we're going to talk about non-state actors in international affairs. Non-state actors encompass a wide variety of agents in global politics outside of the state. For our purposes, I've excluded intergovernmental organizations, which are the collection of states working together through institutions for a common purpose, like the United Nations or the European Union, and the large number of functional intergovernmental organizations like the World Intellectual Property Organization or the Universal Postal Union that we considered previously in class. Even doing so, that still leaves us with a large array of actors in this category. This week we're going to focus primarily on three. First, using the lens of global civil society, we'll consider the role of non-governmental organizations in global politics. Then we'll look at the role of social movements. And finally, we'll return to non-state actors in conflict, looking at the question of terrorism. Before we start, though, it's useful to think about what unites these disparate actors. What do terrorists, wealthy philanthropists, social movements like the Arab Spring or the Occupy Movement, and non-governmental organizations like Amnesty International or Greenpeace have in common? The primary unifying feature is that they occupy a space of political activity outside of the state and the market. We usually refer to this space as civil society. The concept of civil society became popular in the 1990s as groups of people banded together to struggle against authoritarian regimes, especially in Eastern Europe. Indeed, the term was widely used in conjunction with the Solidarity Movement in the Polish shipyards in the 1980s and in Václav Havel's Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia in the late 80s and early 90s. The term itself, however, has a much deeper historical root, which can be traced to the writings of Aristotle and his idea of political community of free and equal citizens living under a common rule of law and in pursuit of a telos, an ultimate goal of human flourishment or well-being. In the aftermath of the collapse of communism and the rise of democracy in Eastern Europe, it became increasingly common to think about a global civil society that connected people around the world. Depending upon how we think about civil society, we can arrive at competing interpretations of its impact and its importance. Writing in the aftermath of the American Revolution, Alexis de Tocqueville viewed civil society as the realm of volunteerism and community spirit. He viewed this realm as central to American identity and a root cause for and protector of American democracy. De Tocqueville, in other words, focused on the associational aspects of civil society and saw it primarily for its civilizing qualities, its importance in the development of a shared sense of identity and belonging that provided the foundation for democratic life. The Marxist political theorist Antonio Gramsci, on the other hand, argued that civil society was the realm in which hegemony, those ideas taken as common sense, is both constructed and contested. Gramsci, in other words, saw civil society primarily as a site of so so social or ideological struggle, as a space for challenging or defending existing hegemony. While we spent a lot of time questioning the role and importance of civil society in comparative politics, for our purposes here, a broader understanding is sufficient. But I do want to leave you with one important caveat. We tend to think of civil society in progressive terms, activists seeking a common global good and so on. But civil society also includes groups like the Ku Klux Klan, whose interests and aims are hardly ones of progressive liberalism. At the international level, we normally think of civil society as being comprised of two primary types of actors, non-governmental organizations and social movements. Non-governmental organizations, or NGOs, are voluntary associations formed by individuals to achieve a common purpose, usually oriented beyond themselves and towards a public good. While NGOs may focus on changing governmental policy, they have neither a mandate from the government, nor do they want governmental power. That would make them political parties. Examples of NGOs could include groups focused on broad issues like human rights, peace, and the protection of the environment. Think of Oxfam, Amnesty International, and others. Some NGOs provide relief and humanitarian aid, for example, Doctors Without Borders or the Red Cross Red Crescent, or provide development assistance like the Grameen Bank. Others are information gathering and reporting. Think of Transparency International or the Freedom House. Despite the good they do, NGOs are not without their critics. Some critics argue that extensive reliance on NGOs, especially in fragile or collapsed states in the global south, can relieve the government of responsibilities to the people, weakening democracy and political culture rather than strengthening it. 
In states like Somalia, the government is unable to provide for the basic political goods – education, health care, transportation, infrastructure, enforcement of contracts, and so on – these things that are normally provided by the states. In place of the state, NGOs often provide su such services, but in doing so they may inadvertently undermine the sense of national identity ne necessary for the emergence of, of a democratic polis. It can perpetuate the cycle of low capacity, corruption, and lack of accountability in government. Others criticize NGOs as self-interested actors like any others, competing against one another for funding and influence. They argue that NGOs are rarely transparent in providing information about their funding, staffing, operations, and expenditures. And because of their reliance on donors, particularly those in the global north, NGOs may often reflect the northern biases and preconception of those donors. Social movements also exist within civil society, but represent a less organized or more spontaneous and less structured form of political engagement. They are mass-based associations dedicated to changing the status quo. Such movements may be organized around major social cleavages like class, gender, religion, race, ethnicity, and so on, or around specific social goals like protecting the environment, human rights, opposing abortion, or immigration. NGOs often play a key role in social movements, helping to frame issues that make them resonate with the public, and helping to mobilize the necessary structures and resources to sustain the popular movement. Historical examples from the United States might include the women's suffrage movement, which expanded the franchise to women, or the civil rights movement of the 1960s, or the anti-war movement of the, of the late 1960s. We could also think of the, the global campaign to ban landmines, or the Jubilee 2000 campaign to forget forgive the debt of the world's poorest countries. Or more, more recently, the Me Too movement would also fall in this category. At the international level, an exemplar might be the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring was sparked on December 17, 2010, when a Tunisian street vendor by the name of Mohamed Bozazi set himself on fire in response to the confiscation of his wares and the continued harassment and humiliation at the hands of municipal officials in Tangiers. His self-immolation galvanized the frustration of young Tunisians and led to mass demonstrations that forced the resignation of the country's president, Ben Ali, who had ruled over the country for 23 years. The Tunisian protests quickly sparked similar mass demonstrations against authoritarian leaders in Bahrain, Egypt, Libya, Syria, Yemen, and elsewhere in the Arab world. The Arab Spring had a dramatic, if uneven, impact on the Arab world. The protests in Libya and Syria led to, led to social collapse. In Egypt and Tunisia, military regimes were replaced, at least in the short term, by democratic ones. And in many of the Gulf states, governments, or more accurately, the political elites, were able to co-opt the movement and maintain social order without significant social change. But the Arab Spring, like the movements from American history, testified to the power of social movements in international relations. The third form of non-state actor in international relations are terrorist organizations. There's been a great deal of debate in, the global in global politics over the definition and use of the term terrorism. An old aphorism is that one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. Our book defines terrorism as the use or threat of violence by non-state actors to influence citizens or governments in pursuit of political or so social change. But this definition is imperfect, and two key areas of debate usually emerge. First, can states commit acts of terror? The definition our book provides necessarily excludes acts of violence intended to influence citizens or government in pursuit of political change if performed by the state. In other words, if a group kidnaps and murders civilians in pursuit of political or social change, it would be considered an act of terror. But if a state did the same thing, committed the same acts, for even the same goals, it would not be an act of terror. Second, many post-colonial regimes argue that the acts of struggle conducted against foreign occupation should not be considered terror. To that end, the African Union and the Organization of Islamic Co Cooperation distinguish between acts of terrorism and acts committed in the fight for self-determination or against occupation. Despite the debates over definitions, terrorism includes a wide variety of actors in search of competing political goals. Some of the most well-known might include Al-Qaeda, which was responsible for the September 11, 2001 terror attacks against the United States and sought to force an American withdrawal from the Middle East. The Islamic State, which seeks to establish a caliphate across the Middle East and North Africa. The Irish Republican Army, which sought to expel Britain from Northern Ireland 
and the Basque Fatherland and Liberty, or ETA, which seeks to establish an independent Basque state in northern Spain. And finally, one group of non-state actors that are interesting to consider and are only recently coming into analysis are what the State Department deems super-empowered individuals. These are individuals who, because of their wealth or popular status, are able to wield a disproportionate influence over global politics, economics, or culture. They do not hold elected or appointed office, but nevertheless influence global politics in important ways. They may be industrialists, criminals, financiers, media moguls, celebrity activists, religious leaders, or even terrorists. They may exert influence in a number of ways, including through money, moral authority, knowledge, or expertise. While some may ultimately hold political office, their influence is not fundamentally linked to their position or office. Think of people like Bill Gates, who, through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, provides billions of dollars in funding every year and helps shape discussions of global health and development. Or celebrities like Bono, who uses his popularity to draw attention to the challenges of development and the problem of odious debt, particularly in Africa. Or Emma Watson, who served as the United Nations Goodwill Ambassador and used that petition, position to promote the He for She campaign and women's rights or Malala, the Pakistani woman who became an international role model and activist for girls' education after the local Taliban tried to murder her when she was just 15 simply because she wanted to attend school. Unless we think all super-empowered individuals are progressive, we can also think of actors like Pablo Escobar, who ran the Medellin cartel in Colombia, or Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, who ran the world's largest drug cartel in Mexico until his arrest in 2016. The key point to remember is that these, individu these are individuals who are able to wield a disproportionate influence in global politics owing to their wealth, celebrity status, or unique position or knowledge. So by way of conclusion, I want to leave you with a few questions to consider. First, how do non-state actors challenge the status quo in international relations? Second, how have states and intergovernmental organizations responded to these non-state actors? And finally, do you think that non-state actors are increasing in importance in international relations? And if so, why?